Hi guys, welcome back to my channel or to my channel if you're new. My name is Christina. Today I will be doing a question and answer on some oral and maxillofacial surgery related questions that I received in my DMs around match day. This is not at all a comprehensive video on how I got into oral surgery or how I got into den uh, dental school. These are just some questions that I received recently that I wanted to make sure I answered in a timely manner. If you have any more questions, I'd be happy to make a part two of this video or if you want to hear about my journey in its entirety, I'd be happy to make one of those videos as well. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Question number one. Looking back at my journey, is there anything I'd recommend? Yes. When I applied to dental school, I knew that my undergraduate GPA wasn't where I necessarily wanted it to be. Thankfully, I still got into dental school but who knew my undergrad GPA would still be a factor? If I could go back, I would just recommend getting good grades from the jump. Your undergrad GPA does play a role, especially if you're interested in dual degree programs like I am. I feel like my undergrad GPA weighed pretty heavily, especially because I go to a pass, fail, or pass, no pass dental school right now. And there's not much they can go on in terms of class ranking, or grades so i think that some programs definitely looked at my undergrad gpa as an indication of how well i would do in their program which my undergrad gpa wasn't terrible i'm not gonna lie i don't remember my exact gpa i think it was around a 3.3 when i made the transition from mississippi where i lived in high school to los angeles for college i went through a lot of changes and it, it took a toll on me mentally for sure. I started off doing pretty poorly in school. I think my first semester I got like 3.0 or something. I ended up finishing consistently with like a 3.7, 3.8. Getting the 3.0 my first year still made my cumulative GPA pretty low. Question number two, when did I know this was the specialty that I wanted to pursue? I knew that I wanted to pursue oral surgery before I started dental school. The first dental specialist I met when I was 17 years old also happened to be the first black provider that I ever had. He just asked me, what do you want to do after college? What do you want to do with your degree? I knew from a young age that I wanted to be in medicine. I didn't know that I wanted to be in dentistry specifically until later. I told him, you know, oh, I want to be a doctor. I want to go to medical school, be some type of doctor. I don't know what kind, but... And he said, well, have you ever considered oral surgery? Well, I never even heard of an oral surgeon, so of course not. <laughs> it didn't even click to me at that time that he was a specialist within dentistry. I just kind of thought, oh, you know, you go to dental school and you choose to be an oral surgeon. I just remember he was really happy with his career path and his lifestyle. That was always in the back of my head uh, as I went through undergrad. I made sure to shadow a lot of oral surgeons, uh, before I even started dental school and I joined oral surgery track as soon as you could uh, D1 year and that exposed me to a lot of workshops a lot of lectures they paired me with a mentor so I was able to go to the operating room as soon as I got into dental school I knew that oral surgery was the perfect combination of problem solving skills creativity and honestly just the type of working environment that I, I could see myself thriving in so I decided to go for it. Question number three, did I have research or some extracurriculars that made my application stand out? I did have research. It wasn't scientific based really, it was more sociology. And honestly, I wish I had found a research project that I was more interested in. I really didn't talk about my research that much, but I did get a publication out of it, which I, I think may have helped my application. I think it differs for different programs. Some programs are really research heavy and some programs are not. And in regards to extracurriculars, the amount of leadership experience that I had stood out and the amount of volunteer experience I had stood out. If I could give you guys any advice, it would be to start your CV right now. Start your CV as early as possible. If you're an undergrad, start your CV now. Projects that you've done, the volunteer events that you've been a part of, things that you've helped organize, places where you've worked, um, 
literally everything that you can think of. Write that down, write a small description and just keep yourself organized. Question number four, what are some great extracurriculars? More specifically, my leadership experience included being vice president of SNDA, so Student National Dental Association, which is pretty much the dental uh, club for students of color, uh, particularly black students. I started off as D1 rep for them and then vice president and then co-president. I've also been Apollonian Society representative all four years and that's basically the alumni rep for my class. I was uh, an RA for something called SNDEP. Now it's called SHIPEP, which is <laughs> Summer Health Professions Education Program. If you are either a, I believe, sophomore or junior in undergrad, now is your time to apply for it. Highly, highly, highly recommend SHIPEP. It pretty much got me to where I am. I know that sounds really extreme, but I, I don't think I, I would be in dental school without SHIPEP. That was where I found faculty mentors, uh, dental student mentors. I did SMDEP at UCLA and ended up going there for dental school, so that's pretty cool. I've also been a mentor on some different uh, collaborative projects. I've been like a, a media or communications or photography chair for a few different organizations at school. Those were most of my leadership experiences. My volunteer experiences were all over the place. A majority of my volunteer experience was not oral surgery based. Dental school is a time where you should figure out if this is for you and how can you do that without other experiences, right? Question number five, when is a good time to take the CBSC? So the CBSC, for those of you who don't know, do I know? <laughs> So the CVSE is the Comprehensive Basic Science Examination. CVSE is created by the same people who create step one, sometimes required by uh, medical schools as a prerequisite to being able to sit for their actual step one exam. And the CVSE is used for oral surgery applicants to try to project how well they would do on step one should they matriculate into a program where they have to take it. There are four-year programs where you're not going to med school. Your CBSC score is still important. A good time to take the CBSC is as early as possible. The CBSC is pretty expensive. I wanted to fully study before I took it for the first time. I didn't want to have my first time be a dry run. I personally took the CBSC winter quarter of my D3 year and then I took it a second time summer quarter of my D4 year. So the very beginning of my D4 year, uh, basically right before applying. That brings us to our next question. Question number six, what did I get on my CBSC? CBSC score, it can definitely be a personal question for some people, so I wouldn't recommend just asking anyone, but I feel like it's important to let you guys know that it's okay if you didn't get the highest score. You can still get interviews. I still got interviews. I still matched. My CBSE score was a 69. A lot of things that you see online will say that to be comfortable, you want to have a CBSE score of 70, uh, which is a 200 on step. And so I got a 199. I definitely was not comfortable when I was applying. I just prayed and hoped for the best and hoped that the rest of my application made it clear that I was passionate about oral surgery and that I was extremely dedicated and that my score was not reflective of my actual knowledge base and how much effort I put into the test. It is a one day cross sectional representation of what you know. I just didn't score how I wanted to. Question number seven, how did I study for it? So my study schedule is a little convoluted I don't know that I'm the best person to ask how to study for the CBSC. I do recommend, however, looking up resources to study for step one. I think that is more advantageous to you than to look up things studying for CBSC specifically. I won't get into too many specifics. I feel like that should be another video about my like study timeline and stuff, but I'll just let you know some resources that I used. Well, I did use Anki to uh, memorize most of the things for the CBSC. I think that Anki is the most helpful tool that you can use for long-term retention. I pretty much used three decks mainly. I used Pepper Deck, which included Sketchy Micro and Sketchy Farm. So I completed that my D1 year and then I re 
I went through that entire deck again my D2 year when I said, okay, you have to take this test. You have to take this test. And then I used Bro's deck, but I actually only used the high yield deck because it was only a couple thousand cards. I also made my own Anki card deck from every question that I missed during my U World run, run throughs. I used U World and I went through the entire question bank twice. My last resource is First Aid. You can't look up step without coming across first aid. This is supposed to be your like Bible while you're studying. I started reading through all the first aid the week before my exam, the first time that I sat for it. I think reading through all the first aid that fast actually really helped my score because it helped me consolidate all the things that I had just spent time memorizing for the past few months with Anki and U World. It's a great organized way to basically review everything that you just put into your head. And that is the extremely short version of how I studied for the CBSE. <laughs> Question number eight, how many externships did I do? So I did three externships. Technically, I only did two externships if you count the ones in person. And that brings us to question number nine. At what point did I begin going on externships? So because of COVID, I did not go start going on externships until summer of D4 years. I sat for my second attempt at the CBSC and then I immediately started going on externships. I reached out to about six programs and only two got back to me. Uh, the first externship that I did was at University of Michigan and I'm actually originally from Michigan. So I thought it'd be nice to visit home, see family and get some work done at the same time. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I would love to make a more in-depth video on externships as well. If you guys want advice on how to choose externships, what to do during your externships. The second externship that I did was for Texas A&M. So I flew to Dallas about two weeks after my externship at Michigan. And so this was September 2021 to October 2021 that I did these two externships. You can start externships during your D3 year. If you have time during your winter break during D3 year, I recommend starting then. Some programs have cutoff dates for their externship applications, even if it's months out. So I know one program in Texas, you had to apply by like May or something like that if you or apply by March if you wanted to go on externships in June. So just pay attention to stuff like that as early as possible. Last and final question, question number 10. How did the interview look like? Or what did the interview look like? This is gonna differ from program to program, right? Some programs put in more effort than other programs to set up their interview days. And I feel like those were the programs that I liked the most. As much as you feel like you're begging for a position at these places, these programs need you as much as you want to go to them. It's really important that you both give off good impressions of each other. Some programs had full interview days where I was on Zoom from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Other programs had a virtual interview and then an optional in-person social. I did go to the optional in-person social because I feel like if you're really interested in a program, it's imperative that you show that interest. If you have a ton of interviews and they're not that high up on your list or you just don't have the funds to travel, then don't feel pressed to go, but I do think it's pretty important. I did have a program that had completely in-person interview, which I loved. Interviewing in person is so fun. There's nothing like it. You get to meet people who could potentially be your co-resident. Actually, I did meet my co-resident at that in-person interview, which is pretty cool. I'm really hopeful for you guys that interviews will be in person again, but who knows? Maybe they'll be optional. Maybe they'll be half and half. The obvious pro of having mostly virtual interviews is money. So the interview process was really expensive, but I know that I probably would have spent twice as much if they were in person. So I'm still pretty grateful for virtual interviews because this was a very expensive process. I mean, just think about it as investing in yourself, which it definitely is. And I do recommend applying to as many programs as possible. Every year it gets more competitive. So there is an obvious correlation with the more money you spend, the more applications you send out, the more likely that you're gonna get interviews from that application, the more likely 
it is that you're going to match. My recommendation is just to make sure that you have a budget in place during this process to keep you on track. There are supplementary fees that add up. My advice is just to stay as organized as possible. I created an Excel spreadsheet throughout this entire process and I think it really kept me on track for in terms of the things that I had to turn in, the money that I had to pay. Yeah, I think that's about it. I really hope this was helpful for you guys and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.